Mike, why do you have to talk like that? Well, I'm talking to you the way I want to talk to you. Do you have a problem? Turn off your station. You know, it seems like you've always been attracted to the, the guys that are still in the streets to a certain degree. Do you think that's a, a fair statement? You know, attracted to them? Well, not attracted to them, but I mean, you like having them around. And I like having them around? I'm just asking. You think, I like, you think I'm friends? What do you think? You think I like having them around? Hello? It's so interesting that you come across like a nice guy, but you're really a piece of Hey, with that come comment. on, come on. That's... No, that was a piece of you. That was a piece of You know, we're, we're doing we're doing live TV. Hey, now. I don't care. What are you going to do about it? All right. We're, we're, we're going we're, we're, we're gonna to wrap, wrap up this interview. Thank, thank, you for, thank you for coming in. Mike Tyson is known for his ferocity in the ring, his fists doing all the talking, making opponents think twice about facing him. But there were some outside the ring who also felt the full force of his wrath. Dumb reporters. You'd think people would be careful with their questions around one of the most intimidating athletes ever, but some just never get the memo. Is it nerve-wracking for you to do something like this, or is it more nervous for you to box? How does it compare? I don't know. Um, it's more nerve-wracking for me to hear us talking to a rap piece of like oh, one of the most infamous moments came when an interviewer decided to bring up one of the most sensitive and personal topics for Tyson, his daughter. In 2009, Mike Tyson tragically lost his four-year-old daughter, Exodus, in a horrific accident. It was an incredibly painful time for him, as it would be for any parent. Yet during a 2011 interview, a reporter thought it was appropriate to bring up that tragedy, hoping to get some sort of deep, emotional reaction on air. This is my best thinking at the time. Get my gun. Automatic, just like this, and you just go crazy. Who are you gonna? Who are you gonna hurt? Regardless, that's just my first thought. Tyson attempted to answer the question, but after a long, tense pause, something in him just switched. After that brief moment of silence, Tyson simply told the reporter, "You have to go," and the interview was done. You have to go. Nothing. You understand, right? The reporter later admitted that Tyson's words left him completely speechless, describing the moment as one of the most chilling experiences he'd ever had in his career. I was speechless. And I don't know if you heard him say, you have to go now. Yeah. That was one of the most chilling second and a half or two seconds I've ever experienced in any interview I've ever done. Now, there's another reporter who also didn't get the memo about staying on Tyson's good side. Back in 1999, Tyson was gearing up for his fight against Francois Botha, and he was in a mood, feeling aggro and ready to unleash some serious energy in the ring. It wasn't surprising that his interviews leading up to the fight had a certain edge to them. Tyson was answering questions in his usual no-nonsense way, making it clear he was in fight mode. Both a six to one underdog. Are there any concerns on your part? I don't know anything about that. I don't know nothing about numbers. I just know what I can do. How about this mother Okay. You take into the ring a lot of rage. Does that work for you or does it work against you at times? You know, who cares? We're in a fight anyway. But then, this interviewer made the mistake of asking Tyson, why are you talking like that? As if it wasn't obvious. Tyson didn't miss a beat and quickly put him in his place, letting him know he wasn't the one to mess with. Mike, why do you have to talk like that? Well, I'm talking to you the way I want to talk to you. Do you have a problem? Turn off your station. Then there's the 2014 interview with CP24 Toronto news anchor Nathan Downer, who also ended up learning a tough lesson. Tyson was promoting his one-man show, Mike Tyson, Undisputed Truth, and the interview was actually off to a decent start. Tyson was smiling, and everything seemed cool. Alex, thanks for joining us, both of you. I'll start with yourself. Uh, many are wondering, how did that happen, this meeting with, with the mayor? I have no idea. It's my fault again. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the day. But then out of nowhere, Downer decided to hit Tyson with a curveball. He asked if Tyson, who had been convicted of SA years prior, had damaged Toronto Mayor Rob Ford's re-election campaign by associating with him during a meet and greet. Your critics would say, you know, there's a race for mayor. We know you're a convicted this could hurt his campaign. How would you respond to that? Tyson, to his credit, didn't immediately blow up. He tried to brush the question off. I don't know who said that. You don't even want to say that. You know what I mean? And I don't have no comment to that, you know, because it's negative and you're being negative. And I, 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 met, I met the mayor. But you could tell Downer had hit a nerve. 
Tyson wasn't about to let that slide. He cut off his handler and made sure to let everyone know exactly how he felt about the question, and let's just say it wasn't pretty. Hello. It's so interesting that you come across like a nice guy, but you really a piece of sh Hey, with that come comment. on, come on. That's no, that was a piece of you. That was a piece of shit. You know, we're, we're, doing, we're doing live TV. Hey, now. I don't care. What are you going to do about it? Right. Is it nerve wracking for you to do something like this, or is it more nervous for you to box? How does it compare? I don't know. Um, it's more nerve wracking for me to hear us talking to a rap piece of shit like oh, you. Come on. All right. We didn't have to we're going to we're, we're, we're gonna wrap up this interview. Thank Let's you for this. thank you for coming in. You. And then there's DJ Vlad. This guy has built a reputation for being that interviewer, polarizing, biased, and known for asking questions that feel more like an interrogation than an interview. Some even accuse him of being more like the feds than a journalist, digging for dirt in a way that rubs a lot of people the wrong way. Vlad has pulled this stunt with a lot of people, but when he tried it with Mike Tyson, he quickly learned that his usual approach wasn't going to fly. From the moment the interview started, Tyson's intense, no-nonsense demeanor clearly put Vlad on edge. Tyson wasn't playing around, and it showed. Vlad, who's normally confident in his line of questioning, started to fumble his words and visibly backtrack during the conversation. It was one of those rare moments where you could tell even he knew he had to tread lightly. You know, it seems like you've always been attracted to the, the guys that are still in the streets to a certain degree. Do you think that's a fair statement? You know, attracted to them? Well, not attracted to them, but I mean, you like having them around. Like having them around? I'm just asking. You think, I like, you think I'm friends? What do you think? You think I like having them around? You just spoke nicely about Zip, so I just thought. Yeah, um... No, I don't know who these guys are. Tyson's presence was enough to make Vlad switch gears, realizing that pushing too hard with a guy like Mike could end very badly. Another person who quickly learned that lesson was Joe Rogan. Rogan, who's usually laid back and loves a good joke, thought it was okay to laugh during a conversation with Tyson, even though Mike was being dead serious. Oh. Let me tell you that video. Yeah. I did that video and I was in bed for a week. <laughs> that was 30 seconds and I was in bed for a week. Tyson didn't even need to get angry. Just one word from him made Rogan swallow that laugh immediately. <laughs> and it's not funny because it made me realize that this is, this is, this is big boy shit, okay? Big boy but it's not just Tyson who's had to handle disrespectful interviewers. Plenty of rappers have been in similar situations shutting down journalists or interviewers who overstep their boundaries. Take Lil Wayne, for example. His situation is a bit different because instead of being interviewed, he went head-to-head -head with a lawyer. Despite this, Wayne still managed to outsmart the lawyer, making it one of the most entertaining legal proceedings for his fans. In June 2012, Lil Wayne was suing Quincy Jones III over a documentary about him. Q3 had his production team follow Wayne around for months to chronicle his life as he was putting together his album, The Carter Three. Initially, Wayne seemed on board with the project, but things went south when he saw the final product. He hated the movie, calling it a scandalous portrayal. During the legal proceedings, Lil Wayne was grilled by Quincy's lawyer, Pete Ross, from the powerhouse law firm Brown George Ross. But Wayne, being Wayne, couldn't care less about the questions and was totally nonchalant. Hey, well, they, that's not the question. What's like, his what? name? Pete Ross. Huh? Pete Ross. Pete Ross. Yeah. Just, that's a stupid question. You just saw me on there giving an interview with her. Okay. Have I ever hired a photographer to photograph her? Sorry, sir. No, I'm a superstar. People hire them themselves to photograph me. We don't hire them. When the lawyer tried to hammer Wayne about his criminal record, the rapper claimed he remembered nothing. Didn't you serve about eight months at Rikers Island in 2010? I don't know. When? I don't know. The award for best rap album of the year in 2008 know. for the Carter Three? I don't know. Uh, Mr. Carter, you have to wait until the, uh, the attorney is finished a a asking the question, please. The whole thing took a wild turn when Wayne allegedly made threats against Pete Ross, although Wayne later insisted he wasn't threatening the lawyer. I'd like I to save you, right? In the real world. That guy right there, he can't save me in the real world. Just so you know. What does that mean? I don't have to elaborate. He can't save you. And what does that mean? I was talking to myself. Then take this infamous Kodak Black interview on Hot 97 with Ebro, Laura Stiles, and Peter Rosenberg. Ebro set the tone poorly right from the start, and you could feel the tension. Um, first of all, I gotta be honest, I was skeptical um, on doing this interview. I saw your other interviews where you was wearing like a ski mask and all that, and I was like, ah, I'm not really interested. The interview ran for about 17 minutes, with the hosts asking Kodak various questions about his music. But then Abro brought up Kodak's SA case, which clearly made Kodak uneasy. 
Given that it was an ongoing legal matter, anything Kodak said could potentially be used against him in court, so naturally he didn't want to talk about it. You'd think the interviewer would get that, but things only got worse. But you know, we take here serious, and we can't, you know, uh, get into details, but we hope, you know, to have you back so we can have a, a deeper conversation. And we're hearing these stories a lot. Ebro didn't stop there. At one point, someone even asked Kodak about a bizarre conspiracy theory involving the moon. The yeah, that landing on the moon was a conspiracy. Kodak, do you believe that our moon landing in 1969 actually took place? What the y'all talking about? <laughs> Abro, not content with the awkwardness already created, circles back to the SA case. You seem upset that I brought it up. Sometimes when like we going through like y'all be entertained by bull, you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Like change the subject and I'm gonna walk out. Despite Kodak's clear warning that he would walk out if they continued with that topic, Abro pressed on. So true to his word, Kodak got up and left the show. We change which subject? Just whatever. Like, well, no, they the tried to change the subject. They was talking about the moon landing. That's bull too. So uh -huh. Talk about something else. Talk about nothing else. We could be done right here. All right, I'm gone. Say this. Lots of bummer. Uh, much like when 50 Cent walked out of his interview with Complex's Speedy Mormon, 50 was there to promote his ABC crime drama, For Life, as the executive producer. The conversation was going fine until Speedy started poking around 50's beef with French Montana. 50 made it clear he didn't want to go there. But Speedy didn't back off. He pushed further. Sure, uh, 50, I guess I'll get you out on this. It seems as though it all started with playful banter. It still seems that way to me, but what's mm -hmm. up with French? Are you guys cool? Are you not cool? I don't really have interest in it. Asking about a rumor involving an altercation at a club, 50 denied anything happened, but the persistence really ticked him off, leading him to eventually leave the interview. There, there was rumors that you snuffed him in a club in Miami or something. Is there any truth to any of that? Would I do a thing like that? I don't know, if I wouldn't put it past you. Why would you think that way? Would you think Will Smith would do that? I, would I can't believe you would say these things about me. Sometimes, though, rappers don't walk out. They confront the issue head on. Take Fred Rose Starr's explosive moment on The Breakfast Club back in 2014. Onyx was there for an interview, and things were rolling smoothly at first. They talked about how they got discovered and their journey with DJ Jam Master J. But then, Charlemagne decided to bring up Fredro's past involvement with Brandy. The air in the studio instantly changed. Fredro didn't want to discuss it, especially since there were rumors about Brandy being age at the time. He got visibly agitated, stating that Charlemagne had hit a sore spot. Hey, uh, this, this, I, this I, your radio station. Cause you know why? This your block, nigga. Why? Because I know it was an ambush. You got ran off your own I don't block. know what them guys had planned. You got so I had to get out the way. You got ran off your own block, man. So good, though. Why we got an issue, bro? Because you brought some up that I ain't like, nigga. And, it's, and, it's, and I don't like that. I ain't, I ain't no. I ain't say you what. But Charlemagne, instead of backing down, asked Fredro what he wanted him to do about it. That question flipped the switch for Fredro, who completely lost his cool. I don't know what you want me to do. You, know, you, you can't do? do nothing. Nigga. You can't do nothing. Nigga. That's what I'm saying. Nigga. You can't do nothing, big man. You it's can't do good. nothing. Nigga. I know it's all good. Nigga. My name is Fredro Star. Do your googles. What the f you want to do? Nigga. The tension skyrocketed and it felt like things could get physical any second. Amazingly, it didn't, but you could tell Fredro was ready for whatever might happen next. Charlemagne has a knack for provoking some intense reactions from his interviewees, just like when one of the most iconic moments in hip hop history took place on The Breakfast Club when Birdman showed up. From the moment he walked in, it was clear he wasn't in the mood for games. He told all three hosts, Charlemagne, DJ Envy, and Angela Yee, to stop playing with his name. You could feel the tension in the room skyrocket instantly. I want to start this off straight, telling all three of y'all, stop playing with my name. Let's go on there, let's go. Stop playing with my name. Let's go. Let's right do in. it on camera. Stop playing with my name. Let's I ain't go gonna right say on it. There. Birdman was clearly riled up, and he wasn't shy about expressing it. He demanded respect, saying, when my name come up, respect it. And then he dropped the now famous line, stop playing with my F asterisk asterisk asterisking name, all three of y'all. When my name come up, respect it. Let's go. Stop playing with my name. All three of y'all, stop playing with my name. 
I ain't gonna say it no more. After laying down his grievances, the interview kicked off properly, but the mood was far from light. Charlemagne tried to get Birdman to air out his issues, which only made it more obvious that Birdman had a bone to pick with him specifically. Birdman explained he came to the studio to confront Charlemagne face to face because he wanted to handle it like a man. He even mentioned knowing places where he could have pulled up on Charlemagne but didn't because he didn't think it was a gangster move. Hey, Come here, man, just look, I'm here. What's up. happening, man? I wanted to see you. I wanted to talk to you on your man and your face. Absolutely. You understand me? I knew a few places you was at. I could have pulled up, but I don't think that was gangster. Birdman repeated his demand for respect one last time before abruptly leaving the studio. I'm pulling up on you, nigga. Yeah, I'm but I'm the radio guy. Why well, pull up on the radio is. guy? I don't act tough with the radio guy. I hate my nigga. Y'all, y'all, y'all finished or y'all done? I ain't got no more talking. Let's rock. Clearly, Charlemagne had hit a nerve with something he said about Birdman in the past, much like he did with Beanie Ziegel. In October 2016, Beanie Ziegel stopped by the Breakfast Club amid a heated beef with Meek Mill. During the interview, Charlemagne suggested that Beanie sounded like a hater on his diss tracks. I was questioning you with your, with your diss records, man. It's not, you sounded like a hater lately, man. A hater? Yeah. How you, how you say that? Hey. Beanie wasn't having it. He felt Charlemagne wasn't even qualified to comment on the beef. So what that exactly, exactly was the... Girl, you ain't qualified to ask me that question. You ain't qualified to get that answer, bro. Yeah, yeah, that, I think you're a sucker. So I should be out, right? When Charlemagne kept pressing the issue, Beanie didn't hold back. He felt Charlemagne wasn't keeping it real, threatened to walk out, and even called him a sucker. DJ Academics also has a history of pushing buttons, and he really got under Soulja Boy's skin during a 2019 interview on Everyday Struggle. Midway through the show, Academics told Soulja he needed to ditch his Gucci headband because he wore it too often. Soulja responded by pulling out stacks of cash to shut him up, clearly irritated by the implication that he was broke. Things escalated quickly from there. Soul just started going off on everyone in the studio, making it clear he felt disrespected. Oh, hold up, well, the rack oh, shit. I can go by, you know Damn. what I'm saying, my 30 of these headbands, bro. No, you just tried no to play respect. me like I was broke. No. She was like, y'all think Soulja Boy got money in the bank and y'all think, yo, are you crazy? He warned DJ Academics and the rest that they better put some respect on his name or things would get ugly. He even threatened to slap them, feeling that Academics was downplaying his accomplishments and focusing only on the negatives. Soulja Boy even roasted Academics, calling him a hater. Now, y'all gotta face it and y'all gotta respect me, bro. Oh, I'm slap bro. You a hater. That's not a hater. Hater, you gotta pull up the boot behind the knob. Everybody know Drake stole my flow, bro, and that's the end of it. Man, you fat as and that wasn't the only time a rapper went off on DJ Academics. Back at the 2017 BET Awards, Migos were doing a red carpet interview with Academics, Navendra Alexis, and Joe Budden. Academics brought up Takeoff being left off the track Bad and Bougie, which Takeoff didn't appreciate. It's not bad and bougie. I, I ain't left off Bad and Bougie. You think I'm left off Bad and Bougie? Say again? You say I'm left off Bad and Bougie? What you say? You say I'm left off Bad and Bougie? Yeah. Do it look like I'm left off bad and bullshit? Sensing the bad vibe, Academics tried to smooth things over, but Joe Budden had other ideas. He cut off Takeoff and Academics, saying they needed to wrap it up. That's you know, one thing I like about the group, because ever since when you were in, in jail, even though you might see one or the other, y'all move as a collective. All right, we gotta wrap this up, though. Quavo, sensing the disrespect, told Joe to go ahead and wrap it up, which led to Joe dropping the mic and walking out. Close it. Hey, listen, man, I wish I could talk to Amigos longer, man. It's one of my favorite groups. I've been covering for so long. I'm glad they succeeded, man. Hey, man, you That's when things really popped off. Migos, not ones to take disrespect lightly, all stood up, ready to handle it right there on the red carpet. Have a good show. This next rapper took things to a whole new level when he pulled a gun on the interviewer for joking around about his op a bit too much. FYBJ Maine, who's been interviewing Chicago rappers recently, decided to bring his close partner, FBG Butter, onto his platform. At first, the interview was smooth, with J Maine asking legitimate questions and everything going well. But things took a sharp turn midway through when J Maine brought up the topic of snitching involving King Lil J. Butter started to get visibly frustrated when J Maine pulled out a mouse trap to troll him. Butter told J Maine to chill out since they were cool with each other, and he didn't want things to escalate. Another thing for yo, for yo, rat. Boy, what? 
Come on, fuck. Keep playing with me, folks. This a mouse trap. Man, I don't know nothing about that. You be making me mad, brother. I love you, folks. I'm trying to show you love on camera, folks. I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna never flow you out. But this right here, you flowing me out, folks. Bro. That's that's clown J Main. But J Main kept pushing, bringing up Lil J, one of Butter's rivals. You could see Butter's patience wearing thin. I'm saying he's about to stop my money. I'm not finna keep talking about this what this fuck is. It's like I'm arguing with my boyfriend, and I ain't no man, bro. All right, on two grade, so it's like I'm keep going back and forth with Lil J. Then J Main took it even further by placing a big block of cheese on the table, referencing the accusations that Butter snitched on Lil J, which sparked their beef. Seeing the cheese was the last straw for Butter. He pulled out his strap and cocked it, making it clear he wasn't here for the trolling. It's a lot. Come on, J Main, bro. Folk. Come on, G. Come on, folk. Now that's too far, J Main. We gonna start with. This too far, J Man, folk. What the? F That's too far, folk. It was a tense moment, but because J Main and Butter were friends, it didn't escalate further. If it had been someone Butter didn't know, it could have ended tragically. Butter wasn't messing around. Just like Kanye West when he went off on Piers Morgan for continuously cutting him off during their interview, Kanye was discussing his fallout with Adidas and the broader attempts to cancel him. But Piers kept interrupting him, treating him dismissively. Now, let's go top 10 in each one of these categories, right? Let's read Michael B. Jordan. Okay, but contract. why would any of that? Let's okay, but Aaron why would Donald's any of contract. that? Why bro, would any of hey, that? Hey, bro, hey, hey, bro, I ain't finished. I ain't finished my sentence. Nothing has idea. anything to do hey, boy, with regret. Hey, hey boy, don't call hey, me boy, boy. Don't finish. I told you. Oh, don't treat me like a boy then. I'm, I'm gonna not. finish my sentence of my ID. Eventually, Kanye got fed up and walked out of the interview, showing he wasn't going to tolerate that kind of disrespect. Then I will say, I'm sorry. Okay, if that's your position, Inter that's clear. interview, Interview adjourned. Love you. <laughs> but Kanye's walkouts didn't stop there. A few weeks later, he appeared on Tim Pool's show, and the situation repeated itself. During the interview, Kanye wanted to talk about the unfair treatment he felt he received from certain people, but Tim hesitated to get specific, fearing backlash. Kanye pressed him, asking, who are they? And wanting Tim to name the people he felt were against him. I, I, I almost shed a tear, almost, but I still walked in stride through it. Yeah. I, I, think, I think they've been extremely unfair to you. I Who think. was they, though? When Tim refused to be direct, Kanye walked out, frustrated that the host was dodging the issue to avoid getting canceled. In 2018... What do you mean it's not? It, what, what do I mean, like, uh, uh, okay, so how about... Are you leaving? Are you afraid of the press? Kanye wasn't the only rapper who lost his cool during an interview. EBE Bands, a white drill rapper from Chicago, also had a heated moment when DJ Vlad compared him to Slim Jesus, another white drill rapper who was gaining viral fame at the time. Vlad posted an article suggesting that Bands was the next Slim Jesus, which Bands didn't appreciate at all. Your music video. Right. On Vlad, on Vlad TV, right? And, you know, I purposely titled it what I titled it because I wanted to get a lot of attention. Feeling disrespected and wanting to prove he was about that drill life, unlike Slim Jesus, Bands flashed his gun at Vlad to make his point clear. I ain't no next nothing. I've been out before him. Honestly. Months, okay. years before yeah, I, honestly. him. In all honesty, I ain't blow up because my look real and authentic. My is a CO2 gun. Boy, nah, man. Nah. Yeah, no, no, no. Nah. Similarly, the Island Boys had a tense moment on the Danza Project podcast. Just before coming on the show, they had gone viral for kissing each other, and YouTuber Lamique, who was also on the show, asked them if they were going to kiss it out since they were arguing. This question set them off. The Island Boys stood up, letting La Meek know they weren't playing around. I, that's New Orleans lingo for like, yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 I
Right, but at the end of the day, let's keep it 100, because we got both of y'all here, too. What's going on with that's with, with you two kissing each other and Bro, shut your ass and break this Hey, hey, yo, that ass, I would love to see you try Bro, what are you talking about? I would love to see you try that But these two rappers aren't the only ones who get touchy about certain topics. Take Babylos, for example. He started gaining some attention after teaming up with the Island Boys in 2020. He even earned the nickname the Fourth Island Boy from Dance. Not too long ago, though, a situation went south when her rich Kevin tried to get Loss to talk about the viral video of the Island Boys kissing. This upset Loss to the point where he flashed out on the interviewer. Did you see the Island Boys kiss? Bruh, stop mentioning them dudes for real, bruh. Like, no, I'm just saying though, like, no, you bro, see no, them do no. something. Stop doing that, bruh. Like, this interview ain't about that. Like, it could go down in this interview, bruh. Like, Do you want to go down to this interview? Facing backlash from the incident, Loss posted a video trying to clear his name. He explained that he lost his cool because the interviewer wouldn't stop bringing up the Island Boys. It was a good thing the interviewer finally backed off because things could have escalated even more if he had kept pushing. However, it's not always the rapper who storms out of the interview or loses their cool. Sometimes it's the interviewer who ends up in the hot seat. Take 2017, for example, when Lil Yachty appeared on Everyday Struggle with Joe Budden and DJ Academic. Mix. Yachty was on a press run to promote his album and was asked whether he was truly happy with his music and life. Yachty, with his usual upbeat attitude, said he was happy, but Joe Budden wasn't buying it. I don't care about how Yachty feels. I'm telling you how I feel. I am You're giving happy me every day. Wait, say that. Happy. I am happy every day because life is moving in such a positive way, I can't get slowed down. Budden claimed Yachty's answer was just media trained fluff and flew off the handle, insisting that it was impossible for anyone to be happy all the time. Maybe he has been media trained. This is a very media trained answer that I'm getting. Not a media trained answer. All right, so let me respond to what you're how saying. I am. Okay, let me tell you about how humans are. Okay. Cannot tell me. You mm -hmm. would be the line to tell me that as a young man, how old are you? 19. In this industry, in this music industry, in the music business, mm -hmm. you are happy 24 7. That is a lie. Yachty tried to explain his perspective, but Budin was relentless. Yachty. You come from a college dorm room with no money, okay? You scamming credit Which is cards. all college dorm rooms. And, and, it's, and you ain't getting no play with no girls. You're not getting, they have no clothes. You have three, four cars. You got millions of dollars, half a million dollars on your body just to wear. He wasn't satisfied with Yachty's responses and pushed further, demanding to know what Yachty really wanted from hip hop. When Yachty's answer didn't meet his expectations, Budden lost it again, causing quite a scene. Er, well, what do you want me to say? You want me to say- I want uh, you to uh, be uh, aware uh, of your business. I want you to know whether you're in a 360 or not. I want you who's well-spoken and articulates himself well. It was a tense moment that showed how sometimes it's the interviewer who can't handle the answers they're given.